So if you're constantly saying I'm broke and disgusted and busted and nothing, you're probably going to end up that way. But if you say, hey, I can make it, I can do this, good things are coming my way and continually focus on those things, then that's eternal optimism. That is really being, you know, optimistic about, hey, man, I, I can make it. I, I can do this. I have a future. I have a hope. Um, and if you feed your mind with those things, if you continue to fill your mouth with those types of statements, you absolutely make it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if any kids listen, mostly adults probably, this is your host, Matt Drinkon. This is the Eternal Optimist Podcast. Welcome back to yet another episode where just buckle up, friends, because we're about to go on a journey. We're about to talk to my new friend, Mr. Joe Shop. And Joe, I, I, I've seen his, his background bio page and my jaw hits the ground. This man has had so many opportunities to practice patience and gratitude in his life, man. It's just so many challenges overcome. Uh, I'm kind of curious where we might go in the conversation myself. But without any further ado, I want to introduce my new friend, uh, Mr. Joe Shop. Joe, welcome to the show, sir. Uh, Matt, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, real pleasure, real pleasure. And I believe that we've been connected by a couple of people that have been on the show. Uh, you know, one of them was Mr. Jason Putnam uh, from Plum, uh, and also our mutual friend, Jonathan. And I, I've always said Jonathan's last name, right? It's Appel. Uh, Appel. Yep, a Jonathan Appel from Eden Energy Solutions. And, and I love just meeting them and to be connected with you through them. Uh, it's you, you come highly recommended. So we're excited to be here with you. And uh, let's go ahead and dive into the deep end, Joe. Uh, I'd love to just ask you to take us on a journey. Just if you can go back in time and you can start anywhere from birth until today. And if we could start and just start to highlight and talk about what are some of the challenging times or places in your life? We'd love to, uh, we'd love to listen and hear some of the things you've endured and, and gone through. Sure. Sure. Uh, first of all, um, Jason Putnam, Jonathan Appel, two great men. Yes. Um, you know, Jonathan is younger than I am, but he's also been somewhat of a mentor. Uh, and then vice versa, I've played the same role. Jason, same thing. Uh, he's had a lot of uh, positive impact in my life. Um, but, you know, from a from a young kid, um, e even early, early age, three, four years old, I knew that um, – I always enjoyed helping people, lifting people up, building people up. Uh, my brother was always scared as a kid of, of uh, you know, the boogeyman and monsters. He's my older brother. And uh, I just remember my mom telling him one time, hey, if you don't stop picking on your brother. I mean, he's picking on me. And she's like, I'm, I'm going to put you in that closet over there with the boogeyman. And, of course, I go over. He's afraid. I go over the closet and I yell at the closet, ah, you know, get out of here. And, uh, you know, kind of take that fear away from my brother. Um, and I always had this feeling that, you know, when when they ask young kids, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? I never could pinpoint fireman, police officer. I, I just would say I just want to make a difference. Right. I want to help people. OK. Um, and, and however I can do that, um, you know, that's that's what I want to do. But uh, probably the memory that sticks out the very most to me, because. It's vivid. I can still remember exactly where I was standing, where I was walking, what I was doing. I remember every detail uh, of the event, and that's because um, it was definitely life altering. You know, I, I'm walking out of my grandmother's uh, kitchen. Uh, my grandmother raised me for a little small portion of my life. Uh, my mom was going through some struggles, so I stayed with my grandmother and uh, walking out of her kitchen into the den, and I hear audibly a loud voice. Uh, you're going to do something for me one day, son, something great. And I'm looking around, right? I mean, I hear this voice audible. And I know it's just me and my grandmother in the house. So I look to my left, my grandmother standing there in the living room. I said, did you hear that, Nana? She said, hear what, son? I said, I'm supposed to do something one day, something great. She so matter-of-factly looked at me and she said, I know. Um, you know, she, she had some... Uh, divine knowledge uh, huh. some somehow and she knew things uh, that the average person just didn't but uh, she was quite confident in what I just said was was true that some way I'm, I'm gonna do something great one day huh wow so you're there you're at grandma's house you're still how old are you at this time 
five years old. Five years old, you hear some a voice that says to you, you're going to do something one day, something great. Okay? Correct. First benchmark is you heard something and this this is in, in the mind, okay? Right. Great. Uh, please take us forward. <laughs> yeah, so fast forward uh, life from that moment. I, I think it was about two weeks after that time frame that uh, my mom came back into the picture, took us okay. – out of my grandmother's home, you know, moved us in with her. And, um, you know, she dated a lot of rough men, lived in a rough life back then. Um, and uh, early 70s uh, or mid to late 70s, rather. And a lot of rough people in our lives. And from that moment, because, you know, clearly that voice and, and I know my faith, I am very solid in my faith. That voice was the voice of God telling me, hey, I've got plans for you. Uh, so just hang on. And, uh, you know, pretty quickly after that moment, um, life went downhill. I mean, as fast as you could possibly imagine, so many negative things took place in our life. You know, my mom could not, uh, after uh, those first initial months of taking my brother and I back into her home, um, you, you know, she just could not manage it. So we ended up going to live with her at the time. Um, boyfriend, fiance, soon to be husband, we went to live with his mom, um, where I faced a, about a solid year of physical, mental, and sexual abuse. Just, I mean, daily, almost on a daily basis. Uh, just um, some of the worst possible things that you could imagine. And I'm very, very protective of children, always have been. I'm, I've always been a protector in my family uh, growing up. Um, even at a young age, I, I would take on some of the toughest people in life uh, to be a protector. Um, but yeah, went went through, you know, pretty abusive uh, situation from the age of about six years old to seven that pretty rough and then just life you know my mom would get some stability again pick us up take us back with her things would fall apart uh, up until about the age of, of 15 years old and now i want anyone that would hear this to understand my mom is a i mean she is an amazing woman went through a very rough life herself. So having those parenting skills and understanding and how to raise and how to navigate life, she didn't have those skill sets. And so, you know, I, I, I certainly do not blame her. And she has become a phenomenal woman. Uh, 17 years in sobriety has uh, become a drug and alcohol and addiction counselor, has helped so many people um, in recovery. I mean, just a great woman. And She's instrumental in my life here as I'm, you know, as a grown man in my business, as I stand now, you know, navigating life. But um, at the age of 15, uh, there was a just a rough situation at home um, where her boyfriend was not real friendly with me. And he created a, a situation that it was either I'm going to do something to harm him. And that's going to harm my relationship with my mother or I'm going to leave. So at 15 years old, I made the decision that uh, I would leave home. And I, I literally said, my mom has raised me well enough. I'm 15 years old. I'm a grown man. I can go out here and make it on my own. Um, left home that day, packed up my stuff that I could carry. I, I lived in the little town of Elgin, Texas, uh, walked into the big town of Austin, Texas, where I mostly grew up as a young kid. I, I was born and raised in Austin, Texas. Okay. Um, you know, lived in a decent, uh, area of town. You know, my, my, my grandmother and my aunt who also helped to raise me, uh, we lived in a decent upper middle class area of town. So, uh, as I left home and went, walked about, oh, it's about a 40 mile walk into Austin, uh, walked into the neighborhood that I was familiar with and that I grew up in, found a tunnel and uh, called it home. Wow. At 15. Wow. At 15. What was that first, if you can recall, what was that first day that you left and then to that first night where you found the tunnel? What were you thinking about in that time? What was happening 
on that day that you decide to leave? You, you know, just thinking, well, I'll, I'll go out here, right? I'll, I'll, I'll find a way to make it. I'll find a job. I'll, I'll find a way to make it through. Okay. And, you know, I grew up pretty tough, you know, pretty rough and tumble. I was not afraid of a lot of things. And I really had the confidence that I would go out here and survive um, until that first night. <laughs> And, and then things started to feel like, oh, this is surreal. This is you're actually here. There's no warm, comfortable bed to crawl into tonight. There is no warm dinner on the stove. This is uh, you're out here. And I, I, I literally left with I had no money in my pocket. Uh, I had no means at all and really unsure of what I would do. I just knew that. Uh, I've got to do something. I'm I'm a grown man. I can't I can't depend on my mom to take care of me anymore. I got to figure it out. I got to got to make a way. And uh, that first night was certainly surreal. It was cold and, and you know it's uncomfortable. And you're sleeping in a tunnel where there's rats and spiders and snakes. And uh, there's also homeless people that uh, you know they're nefarious. I mean, that's not a very, uh, cozy world to live in. It's, it's pretty nefarious and, uh, can be pretty dangerous to, to live in those homeless communities. That's for sure. Yeah. What was there, if you could uh, regale us with one story in that first day or that first week, uh, anything that really just shocked you, surprised you that, wow, I didn't know it was going to be like this. Just any, anything that stood out that first week. Yeah, you know, the, the first couple of nights were spent there in that uh, tunnel. And then, um, you, you know, you run into a couple of people out there in the homeless community and they're like, hey, you know, there's safety in numbers. There's a little uh, camp over here in the woods, you know, come over here. Uh, but uh, what you learn in those camps, I mean, it's it's like living in a landfill. I mean, it's squalor. It's disgusting. Um and it's, it's pretty intimidating because there's no rules. It's the Wild West. And um, you, you don't – it's it's kind of like those rules. You don't say anything. You didn't see anything, and you don't say anything. And, um, you know, after the, the first couple of nights ending out, ending up over where I thought, okay, there's going to be some safety because uh, you don't sleep. I mean, you keep one eye open, and you're worried about who might come take your things that you do have or – Okay. you know, take advantage of you. I mean, maybe hurt you or even kill you. Um, so I figured, okay, there's people around and that may be a little bit safer, but you learn pretty quickly that, uh, no, without a doubt, there are some pretty nefarious people that will live in these homeless camps that, uh, uh, almost like running a hierarchy or, you know, a dictatorship and they are the number one and they will do what they want in those situations. And you just don't say anything. So, uh, pretty quickly, I left those that that area and just found ways to maintain on my own by myself, kind of stay, keep to myself. You know, I was pretty intimidated by uh, some of what I saw out there. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for for sharing your story. And you know, second, I'd love to. Yeah, let's just keep going forward. Then, like, what's the next uh, uh, checkpoint that uh, you can share with us? Uh, on the uh, on the journey here, my friend. Yeah, man, I uh, ended up getting a job as a landscaper. 16 years old, you know, I'm pushing a lawnmower, which I've nice. like, got plenty of experience at this, right? I, I know how to push a lawnmower. Um, and, you know, I was, the, the gentleman was like, well, you're only 16 and uh, I, you're not old enough for me to hire you. Um, but, the foreman, this is the owner of the company, the foreman, he was like, man, there, there's something about this guy. You know, I'm going to give him a shot. And he told the owner, John, he said, John, what can it hurt? I mean, the guy's going to push along. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? He can, you know, low blade some grass and it'll grow back. You know, it's like, give the guy a shot. So uh, uh, pretty quickly, I mean, I became one of their top guys because, you know, I, I needed to earn a living, right? I, and you know, the, the paycheck that they started me out at pushing this lawnmower certainly was going to, you know, provide some food and, and, you know, maybe some shelter at some point, uh, help me to get off the streets. But, um, you know, so I, I like, okay, well, I don't know much, you know, I got a seventh grade education. I'm 15 years old. I don't have a lot of knowledge, but I can work hard. 
mm-hmm. and I can outwork any of the guys on this crew. I mean, including the foreman. So uh, quickly started to to try and do exactly that. Um, made enough money to buy a truck. Uh, instead of living on the streets, lived in that truck. I felt like it was the Taj Mahal. I felt like, man, I could lock the doors. I bought a pillow, pillow from the, you know, shopping center, a blanket. I thought, man, th- I am comfortable. No one can get at me. I've got my doors locked. I'm, I'm parked over here in my old neighborhood. I just felt safe, and I, I felt like, you know, that was a milestone to say, you're gonna make it, Joe. You're, you're, you're. You're going to get through this. You're going to survive and you'll you'll overcome. And that was just my mentality. Uh, There's never been any quit, um, never any give up. But the foreman realized pretty quickly that um, I would probably come for his job. So uh, within about six months, you know, he found a reason to let me go. Um, And wow. You know, I wasn't worried about it. You know, I was. I figured, you know, I'm going to have a job somewhere quick enough, and I'll I'll, I'll work hard and I'll show somebody that uh, I'm worth taking on. And uh, actually, found a job with uh, some childhood friends that I grew up with. Uh, ended up reconnecting with them. Happened to not by chance, right? But because God has done everything in my life by intention, right? This is the where I'm supposed to be and when I'm supposed to be there. I mean. People sometimes find it hard to believe that it was on purpose, Joe, that you were homeless, right? You think that that's what God's purpose was for your life. But the reality is, how would I know about homelessness and how to help people who are homeless without having been homeless, right? I have to have gone through that uh, in order to get where I'm at today for that to be something that is meaningful to my heart. You know, my wife and I have worked in homeless ministry for 20 years, going out, feeding, ministering, taking clothing, sheltering people, getting people off the streets, reacclimated into the workforce. I mean, there's a there's a lot of opportunity. So when people say you think God intended for you to be homeless, well, that was part of my plight to get to where I needed to be uh, in order to help the people I need to help. Uh, but um yeah, I ran into a good friend of mine. Um, I grew up with as a child. His dad had a small subcontract roofing company going. And I said, hey, I need a job. And they said, hey, we need some workers. So, uh, you know, went in to just be a, a laborer, right? You're, okay. you're going to come in come in, tear off these roofs, you know, you're going to grunt and, you know, you're not going to do anything that takes any knowledge because you don't have any. So just get over here and grunt. And so that's what I did for the next, uh, almost the next year from the eight, you know, mid 16 to mid 17 years old. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I, one of the things I want to comment on, I love your perspective that you had to go through all that to be able to minister and serve the people the way you can serve, because you wouldn't know how to serve them if no. you didn't go through that. And you no. chose to go through that. It was either that or stay, and you chose to go. Sure. And that God's purpose is now right. revealed or fulfilled because of your choice to do that. And yeah, sure. I love it. I love it. So Absolutely. please continue. 17 and a half years old, uh, been in there for a year in the company. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the gentleman that I worked for, man, he had a, a really bad gambling habit. Uh, I quickly became his lead guy over his three sons worked there. And then my older brother, who once I got, you know, uh, he, he, he actually had started working with them, you know, unbeknownst to me about two weeks before I ran into them. So, you know, my older brother is working there and this guy's three sons who have been working for him during the summertime. And now as young adults, 17, 18, 19 years old, they had been working for him for several years. And within about seven months, I became his lead hand. And uh, well, I I was not well received by my brother or his three sons because his oldest son had that lead position. But um, I've always been the guy that says, you know, whatever that guy can do, I can do too, but I'm going to do it better. Uh, and not because I have to be the best, not because I need to be better than them. I just need to make sure I'm the best that I can be. And sometimes, you know, that, that makes people think that you 
are an overachiever, but that that's not the case. I just want to do really well at whatever it is that I do. They didn't have the same attitude. So, you know, quickly I took over as the lead, uh, but this guy had a bad gambling problem. So uh, as a 17 year old kid, I was making, um, they, they would, they had ended up hiring me as their tear off crew. And I charged by the square, by the job. So I would okay. go in there and tear, take two houses, tear them off in the same day. As a 17 year old kid, I was making $400, $500 a day easily. And uh, wow. the, but <laughs> my boss with his gambling habits would show up with half my paycheck every week and say, Hey, I gambled half your money away. I'll catch up to you, I'll get it back to you. Most of the times he would, you know, sometimes it was a little slow, but for me, I didn't care. Uh, you know, I had my own apartment. I'm making you know, hundreds of dollars a day. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm living really the dream. I mean, yeah, uh, making tons of money, got my own vehicle. I got my own place, you know, and, and he always, it was like having a bank account. He always had money that was held in the bank that I knew I would get eventually. Uh, but finally, at one point I said, look, I, I can't keep doing this. If you okay. show up on Friday without my full paycheck, I, I got to go. You know, I've, I've got to go do something else and showed up that Friday. No paycheck. I said, well, sorry, I quit. I, I quit the day. I quit that day. Well, the contractor that we worked for, he called me up immediately. He said, hey, 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 you have to go back to work because you are the lead guy. And since you've been there, we haven't had one single problem. Uh, you have to go back. You know, and I, and I said, that, that's just not going to happen. I uh, can't work for this guy anymore. Not going to do it. You know, and here I am 17 years old, almost 18. And uh, this uh, the contractor calls me back the next day. He says, hey, how about you go to work directly for me? And I said, well, that's great. That would be great. I would love to. But uh, my truck just broke down. I don't have any of the tools that it takes to run a full job site. I got my my hand tools, my personal labor tools, and and that's it. And he said, meet me here at this address tomorrow. I said, okay. Okay. It's a car dealership. Meet him there. He's like, that truck right there already paid for. Here's the keys to it. Uh, jump in that truck. We're going to drive over here to this place. I've already bought a trailer. Uh, then we're going to pick up that trailer. We're going to go to Home Depot. I'm going to buy you every tool you need to be successful to come and put these roofs on for me. And you'll work for me. You won't work for Gary anymore. Wow. And uh, I, I mean, grateful. I, I was just absolutely grateful. He spent uh, probably $15,000 that day, equipped me to be a subcontractor for him. And I started my own small subcontracting business that uh, eventually we turned into, all right, well, we're, we're going to go out and we're going to contract our own work. Um and, uh, you know, that led to a partnership with Clint, who was one of the, the gentlemen, Gary, that I worked for. That was one of his sons. We formed a partnership as young subcontractors and then eventually uh, built up uh, our own contracting business where we had uh, realtors and we had property managers. We had builders. Wow. I mean, we were making uh, I remember one month and, and you know, I'm maybe at this point, maybe 20 years old, you know, over a couple of years span, we started building this business up. And I, I remember uh, we landed a, a particular commercial job. I made $19,000 in one month. Wow. I, I think I was actually 21 when we got that paycheck. I mean, I, I remember through the month, you know, I, I, I got draws in the amount of nine thousand dollars and then at the end of the job i got this bundle with the nice little band wrapped around it from the bank bundle ten thousand dollars cash and i'm like my Whoa! goodness i'm i'm like i'm making it. like <laughs> we're, we're we're gonna make it this company's gonna grow um well my my then business partner clint uh he uh, gets scammed by his older brother to run a telemarketing scheme in San Antonio. Um, and he's, I mean, he tells me, yeah, my brother called me. He said he's making thousands of dollars a day scamming people out of their money for fake TV sets. And I said, and you're going to leave this company that we've been building over the last couple of years to go scam people 
out of their money for fake TVs. And I said, you know, your brother's going to rip you off, right? You're going to be in the same boat as all the people he's scamming. Uh, a month later, he calls me back and he said, I'm still running the business now. I, 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 he, he said, yep, I'm walking away from it. The business is yours. Um, and uh, a month later, he called me back and said, hey, I'm broke. My brother ripped me off. Oh. Um, I, I need to come back to work. And of course, the childhood friend, I said, hey, no problem. You know, I'll see you next week. Come back. We'll pick up where we left off. Um, and we did that for a, a few years. Uh, we did well. We uh, uh, built the business up. Uh, you know, we were doing extremely well. Um, finished a big, big project. Now, the, the sad thing is when we filed all of our paperwork, our DBA was filed strictly in his name. Right. All of the company filings were in his name. We're doing great. That's not been a problem at all. We land this big project. Um, we clear $100,000 profit. We're going to put $50,000 in each of our pockets. Uh, plus, we, we'd set aside money for marketing, a couple of new trucks, getting the trucks detailed out, awesome. right? Steinage, all of this stuff is fixing to happen. And uh, I, I get a text from him. Uh, sorry, man. Uh, I'm, I'm taking everything. Uh, the you're out. You're there. You have no more part of the business. Uh, you're out. Everything's in my name. You know. Sorry about your luck. And and money will do that to people, right? I'm I'm not somebody my you could buy. I, I, I tell people all the time. I've been homeless. You cannot scare me with finances. You you just can't. Even even to this day, right now, nothing you can do. I mean, if I was homeless again, guess what? I would survive. Uh, but. Fifty thousand dollars plus. I mean, I, I lost fifty thousand dollars that day, plus the business that was probably worth, and and he built it up to be probably worth several million dollars. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, he drank himself to death. You know, he uh, uh, drank and drank and drank, and cirrhosis of the liver finally caught up with him, and and uh, you know the the. The beautiful thing is I never held one of those things against him. I was there the day, uh, two days before he gave up his last breath. This man did not know God, was an admitted atheist. And he, he called the family, said, it's, it's over for this guy. He's not going to make it. You need to come say your final goodbyes. Well, he had what a lot of people have that are dying. He has this all of a sudden this burst of energy. He wakes up, right? He's still intubated, but he comes to and he is very aware of everybody that's in the room. And I <laughs> intentionally said, look, I know your position and I know you don't know God and I know you don't believe in Jesus Christ. But are you ready to right now? And that guy's eyes got so big and he was waving me over. But, I mean, just please, please. And uh, my wife and I actually led that man to Christ right there uh, before he passed away. That two days later, um, he took his last breath and, and we were confident and felt really good to know that, uh, you know, that, that's something about uh, when, when you say, you know, always staying positive. You can let these things detract from your life or your happiness or your ability to forgive people, but um, it should, right? I mean, people make mistakes. And yeah. uh, in my faith, you know, they say, how many times do we forgive them? Seven times? No, seven times 70. So, uh, you know, you've, I, I've, I've always found forgiveness for um, people in my life in those situations. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, wow. things directly, you know, really v right after that, um, I ended up finding just some various employment um, with a couple of different roofing companies uh, and then um, ended up going to work for my, my wife's uh, dad's company. Nice uh, metal roofing company, very custom, worked for a lot of custom home builders, uh, you know, doing okay. two, three, four, five million dollar homes. And then uh, that's where probably the second biggest blessing in my life took place. Uh, I took a spill off of a two-story roof and uh, broke my left arm in seven places, crushed my heel, 11 surgeries it took to 
try to repair uh, the damage to uh, to my leg. And uh, just one of those uh, moments where I probably should have died. Uh, yeah. But as I'm going off the roof, the the last thing I said was, okay, God, please don't let me die. That, that's it. You know, I know I'm going to get beat up a little bit on this fall, but uh, please don't let me die. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, hey, Joe, this is, you've only led us up to like, 25 years old right now and you've overcome so much I, one one question it's we're around the 24 25 years of age range i think in your story and it was 10 years ago roughly that you you left home have you been in contact with your mom at all or your brother at all this time what is that what was that like yeah my uh um my brother obviously we we got into contact and and we started working together and that was the first um you know, it'd been almost two years since I'd seen any of my family that I left, you know, in, in Elk. And, uh, yeah. you know, sadly, um, I uh, talked to a few moms over the last two years uh, that uh, had children that had left home. Right. One, the, 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 the mother saw uh, the child again. The other one never. Right. They disappeared. Something happened and, and, and nothing ever came of the case. But uh, I got to thinking about their stories. And for two years, my mom did not hear from me. Her and I were very close and uh, um, I was her baby boy. And uh, I, I know that she went through just a shipwreck of a hard time wondering where I was. Right. I disappeared. I mean, it wasn't in the year in the day of cell phones. There wasn't any easy yeah. communication. Right. So. Uh, I didn't see anyone for almost two years, but when I ran into uh, these these gentlemen to go start roofing, my brother said, "Dude, you need to call mom. She is sick. Like she is dying because you disappeared. You left home and and no one's seen you in almost two years. Like she thinks you're dead." Uh, so wow. okay. uh, I did go home, and and I, I was a very very soft young man. I, I didn't like violence. Didn't want to fight. Didn't want trouble. Didn't like turmoil. Um, but there's something that living on the streets will definitely harden you a little bit. And when I came home, my grandmother just, she cried. She said, where is my Jojo? This is not the young man that left here. And I was like, no, no, sadly it is, it is not. Um, but um, yeah, that, that was, uh, and of, of course my mom and I, I mean, we have, an amazing relationship. My brother and I, uh, Chris, uh, him and I became business partners through part of our plight. And he actually works with, uh, works with us at, at Eden as nice. well. So nice. Well, uh, is, is, is there one more? And I know that you've got plenty we could talk about, but what I'd like to kind of wrap up this section, is there one more place from about that age 25 to now, just one more and maybe we have to come back and have another episode, Joe, because this has been just hearing your story is so inspirational. What's one more inflection point, challenge point for you from 25 on that we might share that you've had to overcome? Uh, yeah, I think uh, really the the injury uh, falling off that roof. I mean, it took 10 yeah. years of my life. I had for the first three years, right? I had such a devastating injury to my left leg. My my left heel was crushed into literal bone dust. Uh, so, and, and work comp in the state of Texas is atrocious. I, I'll just say that. Sorry if I'm offending anybody, but, um, you know, work comp doctors are pretty bad and they just did not care. So they tried to put me back together as cheap as possible, which just led to, um, you know, hey, we've done surgery, you know, you're going to go through six months of healing. Okay, you're healed, start physical therapy, no good, doesn't work, physical therapy is not happening, There, there's pain in there, there's something wrong. Uh, we'll go back and examine, oops, yep, there's something wrong, you know, we didn't have this right. So uh, back to back to back surgeries for three years, I didn't work, um, you know, hobbling around on crutches, surgery after surgery after surgery, which uh, put us into some pretty significant financial despair. Um, you know, I'm still trying to maintain a roofing career, going out, working on these roofs. My wife, uh, she one day said, look, uh, I, I'm, I'm sick every day you go out. Like, I'm worried something's going to happen to you. Uh -huh. um, and I said, look, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll find a different career. I'll find different employment. Um, and went into the manufacturing industry. We were, 
I mean, struggling. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you financially. I mean, just a, a, an immense struggle. My wife was working three jobs to try to keep us from losing our house, you know, lose the cars and uh, found this manufacturing career. And I was like, oh, man, I kind of like this. But I started at the bottom because I had no experience. And uh, so I see is uh, in this manufacturing plant, these guys running these big, fancy CNC machines. And I said, those guys are the ones making the money. I've got to figure out how to get over there and run those machines. Uh, otherwise, my family's not going to make it. I mean, I, I was at the time making about $18 an hour in the roofing industry. It took a $9 an hour pay cut and was making $9 an hour as a as a deburr and detail guy for parts okay. that were being made. Um so uh, looking over at these machines and, of course, each one of these guys have something that I don't uh, on running those machines. And those are high school educations and then degrees that they went to school for to learn how to run these pieces of equipment. And, of course, again, here I am in this D-Bird, you know, department. I'm, I'm taking care of cleaning parts, but I'm like, I got to figure out how to run these machines. So uh, I'm I'm learning how to do some manual milling. And one day, one guy, one day, a guy doesn't show up. Right. And, uh, the supervisor says, Hey, I got to put you over here at the CMC machine and you're going to load this part in here. You're going to hit that button and don't you do another thing. These are $250,000 pieces of equipment. Joe, if you do something wrong, you can cause bad problems. So I said, you know, I feel bad for this guy that didn't show up today, but he's not going to have a job if he's out more than one or two days, I am taking this job. And, uh, supervisor says hey i'm going to bring you this uh next job that's going to go over there and this guy jared's going to come over here he's going to set it up he's going to program it and he's going to get you started and you're just going to hit the button again and uh parts that i'm running you know it's about a two hour cycle time to get through that okay. before jared would come over there's a book about that thick sitting on the table that tells about how to run this machine and how to program it and i just start reading through it and I get the plans for the next job and I'm reading that and I'm looking at this book and I'm like, I can do this. I can figure this out. And by the time that supervisor comes back with Jared, I've got this machine set up. I've got it loaded and I'm running these parts and he's just floored. He's like, how did you figure out? I mean, how did you get this thing going? And I yeah. said, well, there's this book right here. And I can read. So uh, I said, I started reading the book and it tells you step by step. Here's how you turn the machine on. Here's how you do the next step and the next and the next and the next. And, uh, you know, went through that process and uh, became quickly the top machinist in the Austin area. I mean, it's a small community, so you get talked about a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Really took that industry by storm, did really well there for about uh, 12 years. Wow. So 10 years to come back from an, a, a horrific injury, and you had to start over uh, at less than half the pay, I mean, significantly lower pay, and you figured it out. If that's not a testament just to grit and resilience and faith, uh, I mean, I, this is, I was expecting to be inspired today, Joe, but dang. Kudos to wow. you, man. A lot of respect for everything. I, wa I wonder if there's a study, how many people who in their early teen years go to live on the streets, how many of them get off, get off the streets? I mean, uh, I, I've looked into it. I, I've worked with a lot of at-risk teens over the last 25 years. My wife and I, I mean, we've done a lot of either homeless ministry, uh, working with at-risk teens, counseling, ministering, or coaching. And, um, the statistics aren't very friendly, you know, yeah. for people that are going through that particular life. And, you know, of course, I did not accomplish it all on my own. I had a lot of good people that ended up in my life, uh, but also uh, had the hedge of protection from God on my life uh, from from the moment, you know, from from go. I mean, yeah, he had this plan for me to be in this place. Um and, you know, honestly, that's that's how I get to Eden is because here I am. I just got a big raise in this manufacturing plant in a higher in a wage freeze and a higher freeze. I'm the only one in the plant that got a raise. True story. Uh, my wife worked there and she was like, yeah, people are upset because, you know, people talk. And I didn't say anything, but people talk. And 
hey, I, you, you got this raise. But two weeks after I got this raise, uh, they were trying to move me into the front office to, to start doing programming and, and management. Uh, but two weeks after I got the raise, I, I, I got the word from God. He said, you're going to leave this career and you're going to go. Uh, my, my brother, Chris, was still running the with with Steve, my wife's dad. They were still running that family construction or roofing business. Okay. But it was failing. It was just going downhill quickly. The economy was terrible. Uh, God said, quit this lucrative career and go out here and uh, take this business over with your brother and build it back up. And uh, when I came home and told my wife, that's what God said. She said, I'm not sure you're hearing correctly, Joe. Uh, you, are, you, are you sure? And I said, no, I'm, I'm positive that uh, this is the direction that God has me going in. And Everybody said I was an idiot. I mean, I was making a substantial living, taking great care of my family. Uh, and even my brother said, no, way, I'm not going to let you do it. You're not going to quit this career that's taking great care of your family to come out here and struggle with me. And I said, well, uh, I already put in my notice, so I'll, I'll, I'll see you here next week. We got to go to work. Um, we had no job. No work. The economy was so slow. Construction was so dead. And uh, my brother said, there's no work out here. I said, look, Chris, my last day is on Thursday. I'm taking the day off Friday. I'm breathing a deep breath of fresh air. I said, but Monday we'll be working. And he had been courting this company for three months to try to get work out of them. And they just said, we don't have any. But if we get some, we'll call you. So Friday, as I'm taking my day off, kicked back, like, oh, okay, God, it's your turn because I'm going to need a job to do on Monday. Um, my brother calls me up. He said, you will not believe this, but the company I've been calling for three months said nice. they have a job for us to start Monday. And from there, we launched this business, which is how I get to eat, mm. right? Because this is, I, I end up you know, years later, uh, as, as we take over 2011, I, I quit my career, took over this uh, company okay. uh, that we called ATRR. And um, we. Uh, a few years later, as we get this business going, we build a house for a gentleman uh, that um, is moving into the regenerative agriculture space. Uh, he meets Jonathan Appel, right? Okay. Jonathan says, hey, uh, I'm starting up this uh, uh, the, the company with this technology for, you know, converting waste into energy. And uh, I'm going to need some good people. Uh, the gentleman said, hey, look, I know this guy runs his own business. It may be hard to get him, but, uh, you know, he could come in and be head of uh, construction and head of uh, production, head of head of uh, fabrication. And um uh, they approached me with the idea, and I saw the technology. I saw the nobility behind it, uh, the the outpouring from Jonathan and and his sincerity to go out, clean up this planet, turn it back to the Garden of Eden, and leave something uh, substantial for our children, our grandchildren, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, that really got to me uh, living in what was almost like a landfill at 15 years old. Um, it was for me, it was a no brainer. I mean, we could go out and, and make a difference, right? Absolutely. Uh, that, that, that construction business, leaving the manufacturing industry, going into the construction business is how I also met Jason Butler. I did some significant remodel work on his house and uh, him and I are cut from the same cloth. I mean, uh, he has a uh, very similar uh, okay. beginnings, which I won't go into because that's his information. But uh, him and I went through a lot of similar things. And, um, uh, you know, but that that is how uh, I met Jason was because I was in that construction business. But uh, it was a no brainer to get involved with Eden and with Jonathan Appel. Fantastic. I, I, I'd like to uh, ask you a question on the lighter side of things. You've mentioned this, uh, this amazing woman, uh, your wife, a number of times. And I'm curious, at, at what point did you meet her? How, what's the origin story of the two of you? Oh, my. It's one that's hard for people to wrap their minds around. I met her. She was eight years old. And I was... Almost, I was 12 years old, almost 13. There's about five years of difference in our age. Um, and a uh, weird story. You know, I uh, 
was at my aunt's house playing in the front yard. My mom, I, I was raised a lot of years by my aunt. Um, my mom had made friends with my wife's mother uh, and invited them over to our aunt's house. They pulled into the driveway, uh, got out of the car. She got out of the car. I'm standing by the front porch. Our eyes met and, uh, we knew something. I mean, both of us say the same thing. My stomach did a flip flop. My heart did a flip flop. And I knew that there was something there. Um, now, of course, I'm a 13 year old kid and she's a little girl. So, you know, never could anything transpire. Um, as I said, her and I became very close, very, very good friends, um, but nothing ever beyond that. Uh, even I left home. She was she was distraught. She would come to my mom's house expecting to see me, and all of a sudden, I'm gone. Um, her and I had a very close friendship and close relationship. Um, and then I returned back home, 17 years old. I show my, my mom, hey, we're, I'm going over to Steve and Dana's. Would you like to come? Yeah, I'll come. I hadn't seen Tony in several years. I see her. She's 12 years old. Now I'm 17 years old. She sees me. Doll darts, goes back to her bedroom, dolls herself up, comes back, and she's ah. like, oh, hey. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I tell my mom, I said, hey, I, I'm, a, I'm a grown man. You have to talk to Tony. She can't look at me. She can't talk to me. I, I'm a grown man. Like, there can't be this relationship. There just can't be. Um, and then both of us ended up married. Both of us ended up having a child from that marriage. Both of us were at each other's weddings. Uh funny uh turn of events and um i certainly was not i mean i had been waiting for her <laughs> all of my life and i was certainly upset that uh this was not going my direction i was going to wait and wait and wait it just didn't happen um but um you know lo and behold uh god said that this is what he intended all along um, but even as adults when we finally reconnected i was still apprehensive um i stood her up on our first date her, her, oh her, joe <laughs> yeah, like completely no show no call uh oh. because i said man I, i'm a i'm a knucklehead and this is a good woman and i'm going to mess things up so um, I tried to, to say, you know what, we, we just can't do this. And I'm in love with her. I mean, like my heart is just like, Hey, you have to, but I'm like, no, nah, as a man, you, you, you can't, right. You don't want to mess this woman up. Your life is not in a good place right now. Uh, but, uh, her mother refused, uh, her mother knew me well enough and she knew I was maybe a little bit misguided and going through some things in life as a young man, but that uh, <laughs> I would recover from those. And she thought I would be a good man for her wife. So she pushed and helped to navigate that relationship. She did threaten me with uh, physical harm. Uh, she, <laughs> she said, you stood my daughter up and she cried and you're going to get another shot. And you're going to be able to come and take her out again. And she's going to be ready at seven o'clock on Saturday and you'll be here early. And if you stand my daughter up again, I will cut your balls off and shove them down your throat. That was her mom's exact words to me. <laughs> wow. And so I was like, well, I'll be there. Uh, so I showed up and the rest, I mean, we've been married for 21 years now and uh, definitely my best friend. Uh, certainly she saved my life. She helped me to, to pull out of some of the, uh, the knuckleheaded things because in all of the stuff that I mentioned and the trials and tribulations of getting through life and where I was at, um, you know, certainly some of the things I didn't touch on is when you live on the streets, I mean, drugs and alcohol become a very, very common thing because you don't want to think about where you're at. You don't want to deal with where you're at. So you mask that with drugs and alcohol. And certainly I ran the gambit and had all of those struggles that you could imagine uh, somebody would have. Um, yeah. And so I did not want to I did not want to bring her into my life with those struggles course the beautiful thing is as you mentioned uh earlier you know that uh you know some people have discussed their um you know 
plight and, and being able to overcome those things. When Tony and I first got together, when my wife actually finally started to date, uh, she showed up at my house, went to open the pantry to get something to eat. And there was nothing in there except for empty um, bottles of whiskey, because that's what my life was, just a perpetual, all right, I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to navigate life. Uh, and as soon as I get done, I'm going to put some alcohol down my gullet so that I can not think about all of the bad things that I've been through. So that, uh, that did become a pretty vicious cycle for a while. Wow. Well, if, if it's possibility, we've got to get you on for more of the story, Joe. Uh, and before we go though, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, Eden and, you know, sure. what you're pouring your energy and passion into today uh, professionally, because it, it seems like throughout your entire story, there's been a recurring theme is that you, whatever it is, you've shown up and you've worked hard and you've learned and, and you've earned because of your work ethic. So I imagine you're translating that now to where you are. So could you talk a little bit about uh, your experience and your, your kind of your passion now for where you work? Sure. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, you know, it, it's funny enough. Uh, I was told for many years by uh, my pastor's wife, uh, she said, Joe, God's going to put you in places you're not qualified to go. OK. And when I say that, I am the chairman of the board and chief production officer for Eden Energy. Um, those are usually positions that you grow into. You don't just become right. You don't start out in that spot. And uh, it's been an extreme learning curve. Uh, like I said, seventh grade education. Now, I've learned a lot over these last uh, 35 years, you know, from from leaving home. I've obviously educated myself and um, I've always felt felt like I'm highly intelligent, just very uneducated. I mean, when you leave school yeah. at seventh grade, you just don't learn a lot of things. So uh, a lot of learning curve, but it uh, the, my, my passion in being able to help people and Let's face it, Eden has an opportunity to be a very, very lucrative global organization with global reach, global impact, and a substantial amount of money to be made. Money is a non-motivator for me. Uh, I'm, I've never been motivated by money. I have had up to a half a million dollars in my bank account, and I've had zero. So, you know, that, that is not the motivation, but helping people is. And when I met Jonathan and saw the passion he has for trying to help people out, we live in a very toxic, over polluted world. Uh, our ecosystems are being destroyed. Um, I mean, hazardous waste is such a huge problem in this country that people don't talk about uh, because they kind of try to keep that quiet. But it is a big problem. Waste plastic is a huge problem. Uh, the microplastics that are in our rivers, lakes, streams and oceans that we are ingesting every single day are just atrocious. Uh, and so, you know, having uh, an opportunity to go out help clean up the planet, but also aid in one of the areas that we're struggling tremendously in this country, and that's energy demands. I mean, here in Texas, right, every summer they say, please turn your AC off because our grid can't handle the demands. And every winter they're saying, please turn your heater off because our grid can't handle the demands. So we have uh, a system here in a, in a, that, that can actually take all your waste uh, that we're struggling to dispose of, dispose of it safely, create high value end use products, and then create energy, which we're struggling to produce. Um, and for, for us, I mean, truly cleaning up this planet and restoring it back to the Garden of Eden is a possibility. And we've learned in um, navigating this this organization and, and the people that we've met. Uh, we've met a lot of different people that are in this somewhat of a freedom movement, regenerative agriculture, regenerative energies. And there's a big lie that we don't have enough food out there. And there's a big lie that we don't have enough energy out there. But the reality is uh, we're surrounded by energy and we can certainly put this place back into a state of Eden where we can grow mm -hmm. our own food and support ourselves in that manner uh, and just 
we see a, an absolute opportunity to grow this organization, develop a voice, right? One of the reasons that I'm here on this podcast is to hopefully help give some hope to people that there is a better way out there, right? We can clean things up. And when you're talking about taking waste and turning that into revenue, you know, you can create revenue for a lot of different people. Everybody's creating waste. So why can't you take those waste streams that they're creating and turn those into revenue? And we have ideas wow. behind those very things right there where you think about the average American person produces 4.2 to 4.9 pounds of waste per day. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, inter- we got introduced to a, uh, an organization where these folks are taking plastic waste and they're banking it and they're using it as a means of currency in some of these poor countries where waste is a huge problem and they collect these plastic waste. They turn it into this company. The company turns that into credits that they can use to go to the grocery store, wow. buy food, buy you know, water, buy, buy the things and necessities that they need. And uh, I said, man, that, that's brilliant. And then you can take that even further with our technology that can take not just plastic waste, but all carbon-based waste, process it into clean energy. And you create, uh, just like our federal government has done, you create carbon credits. And so when people huh. dispose of their waste in this uh, environmentally positive way using this environmentally positive technology you figure out a way that you could credit them uh incentivize them to use this environmentally uh, positive technology to yeah. throw away their to dispose of their waste and so a lot of areas that we're looking to just be able to help people yeah. uh, again when you talk about the amount of money generated in the in the energy industry uh there's a lot of things that we can do uh philanthropic ventures to go out and help put together the ecosystems rebuild those help with the wildlife uh but also just be an impact in our communities going out engaging with people talking to people and and helping them in the ways that Jonathan and I have both found help in overcoming some of the struggles, obstacles, and adversities that we faced. It, it, what it makes me think is it makes me think I, I've my five, five pounds of uh, trash a day. I step outside, I go to what I might call the Eden Center or go somewhere where there, this technology is present and I deposit this in and I get a carbon credit or uh, it. I wasn't even thinking about getting credits. I just want to dispose of it in a way that doesn't go to a landfill. Correct. <laughs> right. So I come and drop it off here and you have a technology that you already have that takes this stuff and turns it into something that doesn't pollute the environment. <laughs> that's, that, that's what that's you're it. saying. Wow. That's a hundred percent. Well, then what's the, what's the challenge that your, your company is facing then? Cause it almost sounds too good to be true, Joe. Like what's the big obstacle that as a business person now you're facing in, in bringing this to everyone? Those words right there. It's too good to be true. And yeah. we've had, we've had dozens of people tell us that, yeah. uh, this just seems too good to be true. Uh, the reality is, um, You know, this is a technology that's been in the works for 27 years, and it's actually made its way to the main stage a couple of different times. But the business model uh, and each iteration that this technology made its appearance, the business model just wasn't uh, structured properly. So, you know, the biofuel markets, when they collapse, then when you have a biofuel plant that's making biofuel from waste and the biofuel market goes down, so does your plant. Uh, So we've learned that instead of trying to build these big plants and operate and take waste in and sell fuel and sell fertilizers, um, you would just be an equipment manufacturer, right? Decentralize it for one. You're not building this big biorefinery that you have to now navigate getting all of the waste to. Increasing dramatically your carbon footprint with all of the vehicles that have to transport the waste, you decentralize it. You build units that you can present to the waste producer, and now that waste doesn't have to move. The waste producer can take that waste, environmentally positively dispose of it, 
and not just dispose of it, but now create energy that they can use to power facilities, that they can use to power vehicles, that they can use to, uh, you know, you, you make a, a fertilizer, you know, that yeah. you could sell to farmers or, or you know, to ranchers or, or yet yeah, to, to farmers. I mean, you, there are so many benefits to the technology, and that is the biggest hurdle that we have faced is people saying it's too good to be true. Now, in when you have people say it's too good to be true, well, investors say, ah, you know, I'd love to invest, but it seems too good to be true. Now, thankfully, we've overcome some of those hurdles and uh, now building out a very uh, nice testing system that is scaled. Um, it is our proof of concept. This is in the works now we are ordering tanks vessels and reactors this system will be built built out in the next uh, month or so or in the next couple of months this system will be built out and it'll be a technology that we can take this is a um, mobile unit that i'll be able to we'll be able to take around just about anywhere especially these hazardous waste producers and show them, look, we can take your hazardous waste. We can dispose of it environmentally positively and we can produce a yielding uh, valuable product on the, on the back end. So, um, you know, getting this technology out right now is um, that is my biggest goal right now, getting it out there so that we can start to use it because one of the noble things that we want to do is if you look up um, what's called landfill communities uh, or, okay. or waste communities, these are literally communities of people that live in what looks like a local landfill. And we live in a world and in countries with so many financial resources and that someone can look at these people and say that that's acceptable, that they live in this squalor where their children are suffering and dying daily because of the toxicity of the environment that they live in. I mean, these people have it so bad, but that is one of our goals is to set these systems up in these areas at no cost. And as a matter of fact, we're going to pay whatever it takes to get these pieces of equipment there, manned, process the waste, take the proceeds from the waste, uh, the, the, the valuable resources that we recover, take those proceeds and then give them back into this community, build homes, you know, build infrastructure, build things that they can actually live, survive and thrive with yeah. instead of going in the opposite direction. That is, that is one of our uh, goals is to help 15 million people. At wow. minimum, more, it's actually more than 15 million. That's just what they're documenting and recording live in these landfill communities. 15 million people. Mm. We're going to help them. Awesome. And I want to put a bookmark here and leave an open door to come back in the show anytime and, you know, finish you know, more of our discussion, especially as your products, your technology comes to market in a more grand scale, uh, get you on the YouTube channel and share. Cause I, I want to be a part of your mission and help any way that we can, Joe. So, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to, first of all, just transparently share. We'll just say a challenging story. And the things that you endured and overcame to get to this place now where your heart has not been corrupted and, and turned into something other than pure love towards helping other people and just sure. respect you, my friend, and, and love you and thank you. And uh, I'd like to wrap up with just a couple last last questions, a lightning round, if you will, uh, to finish things up. Sure. Uh, I would ask you, um, if, if you are uh, a music guy, is there a song or an artist or a genre that just fills your bucket and inspires you? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, most of what I listen to is uh, uh, Christian music. I mean, I listen to a lot of uh, praise and worship music. And to, to be perfectly honest, my wife, she sings for our praise and worship team. Nice. And she is my favorite artist. Uh, she has a song that she's written that just absolutely knocks my socks off. It's called You're Not Perfect. Uh, so 
Uh, I wish I had a, you know, some some popular artist that people know, but uh, the the reality is, I'd be, again, I wouldn't be truthful if I didn't say that she is absolute my fav my favorite artist. Ah, uh, it, it makes me smile just to think about how uh, where you guys are now, and then thinking about how you met at eight and twelve, uh, and then the love story now in at this age. So it's it's pretty cool to, to hear that um, about books. You know, you, you, you said something earlier that you may not have finished more than the seventh grade. So you may not be as educated, but you're still smart and you still read. And I'm curious if there's a book uh, that you might recommend out there to our listeners that has had an impact. Yeah, um, man, the biggest impact high growth handbook by far. Uh, it is a, a book that is I mean, it, it talks it, it's largely geared towards running a startup, uh, okay. but it is a life's lesson book. Uh, it's helped me to grow in my role uh, that I find myself in now, um, but it is just full of very, very solid information. And then also another one, uh, the book Start With Why. Um, huh. Very, very, huh. very good book that uh, I'm currently reading that just uh, a motivational book motivational book, right? I mean, some very, very good information about people who started from very small beginnings mm -hmm. and were able to come up through adversity and be very, very successful. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, so the last, the last thought goes to you, Joe. This is the Eternal Optimist podcast. When I say Eternal Optimist, what does that mean to you? You know, uh, someone that no matter what, right? No matter the adverse circumstances always keeps that uh, my cup is half full mentality. You know, we can always look and say, man, my, my cup is half empty, man. I, this, this is terrible. This sucks, man. I've been through too much. This is too hard. But the reality is when we reverse that form of thinking, right? Um, something that uh, I, I tell people all the time, right? Even if you're not a faith believing person, right? The law of attraction is one of the most powerful laws in the world. Use it, apply it, try it. If you don't see some impact in your life, then stop, don't do it anymore. But the law of attraction basically says whatever we think about and focus on and say the most, that's what we're gonna get out of life. So if you're constantly saying I'm broke and disgusted and busted and nothing, you're probably going to end up that way. But if you say, hey, I can make it, I can do this, good things are coming my way and continually focus on those things, then that's eternal optimism. That is really being, you know, optimistic about, hey, man, I, I can make it. I, I can do this. I have a future. I have a hope. Um, and if you feed your mind with those things, if you continue to fill your mouth with those types of statements, you absolutely make it.